my friends. Welcome. Happy holidays. Merry Christmas to those that are celebrating. And here we are having a YouTube live focusing today on the frustrations of anxiety recovery. Not only anxiety recovery, overall healing, mental, emotional, physical types of healing and the frustration that we may not be making as much progress as we'd like. So today we're going to dive deep into this topic, my friends, and in the comments section, just let me know if you can hear me. Uh, let's get the technical stuff out of the way. Send me a comment, let me know. And of course, give this YouTube Live a nice little thumbs up if you'd like to have more in the future. But it's nice to connect, and I hope that everybody is having a pleasant holiday experience this year. I really do, um, because it can be very chaotic. It can be very loud. It can be very demanding, right? And what tends to happen often during the holiday season is that a lot of people that suffer from anxiety become more symptomatic, right? And the anticipation of future events, the anticipation of symptoms, heightened level of symptoms, the anticipation of the catastrophic ideas that tend to cross our minds can, can appear and it can be very frustrating, my friends. So uh, today we're going to go through those things and I'm, I'm really excited to be here with you all. I really am. Thumbs up. Yeah. In the comment, uh, I can be heard. That's good. I'm not just talking into thin air. Awesome. Um, after kind of what I want to discuss, please uh, have a few questions in mind. Maybe one really important question that you'd like me to go through as an answer. Um, and if you pop those questions in the comment section, then uh, I will remember them later on as well. So um, what are we drinking? Got a nice little cayenne tea going. Eleni, happy holidays to you as well. To you as well. And just so I kind of get a feel, how have you been recently? Tell me a little bit about the epiphanies that you've had recently based on either my content or someone else's, something you read or heard somewhere, or intuitively what you've come across. I'd love to hear in the comments section kind of what, uh, how you've been going about your healing journey and how things have been unfolding for you. Very important that I can kind of get a good feel of that because it really helps me with content in the future as well. Julie, hello Julie, Mohanad, happy holidays to you as well, my friend. Strawberry polka dot, good morning. And um, let me tell you something, it, it doesn't, for someone suffering the way I used to and uh, both load of bull trading, uh, after we go through some of this important um, ranting that I'd like to do, uh, we're going to go into some questions, yes, for sure. Uh, but frustration with progress. I want you guys to understand that it can be very frustrating, right? And you're not alone. You're far from alone uh, thinking that you're not making as much progress as you'd like. Uh, you're not where you'd like to be after some of the inner work that you've been doing, some of the recognition, some of the realizations. It can be very frustrating. Comment below. Let me know if you 
have or are tapping into some of that frustration, specifically with anxiety and all its elements. Now, here's what I want you guys to understand. This is one of the points I want to make right off the bat here. When we, when we go about our lives, as we're going about our lives, anxiety can unfold and show up at different times. More often than not, anxiety and its elements, its symptoms, its feelings, its thoughts tend to show up when we are no longer distracting ourselves from overwork, from putting other people first, from other elements. And once we no longer are in those phases, so focused on the distractions, uh, going out very often, you know, these sorts of things, um, then the subconscious mind and body, or I like to call it the lower self, the lower self tends to appear and people, people become symptomatic and they experience different elements of anxiety because they are no longer distracting themselves. This deeper part of us, this lower self is finally saying, oh, he's no longer or she's no longer distracting themselves. Can we start dealing with what it is we've been suppressing for so long. And then somebody experiences symptoms or an array of thoughts that just don't feel natural. And they go to the, the doctors, they get the diagnosis and the label of panic disorder sufferer or generalized anxiety or health anxiety sufferers shows up. And then people start to rearrange their lives based around the label, right? Now, what was once something that they were curious over tends to overtake their lives. Comment below if you can relate to what it is I'm talking about here. The, you start to rearrange your life based around the label, right? Now, I want you to understand this, okay? You're doing great work. You're doing the surrender sessions here on this channel. You're reframing some of the past relationships and past traumas. That is also on this YouTube channel. You're gaining mindful techniques as you go about the day in order to kind of not allow fear to sway you in that direction, right? You're doing good work. You are. And you have to understand that we must put the frustrations aside and understand that there are parts to you that still need to catch up to what you consciously now know and believe to be true, okay? So this is very, very important, okay? This is very important. So these unconscious parts, these parts of you in mind, in feeling and emotion, in physical symptom, these parts are now catching up to some of the changes that you're making in your life. And it could be any kind of change. It could be a lifestyle change. It could be new habits. You could be going through one of my programs. It could be any, any kind of change, any kind of alteration on how you want to perceive life and how you want to begin perceiving yourself and other people. Let me give you an example of this. For a very long time, and I highly recommend this technique as well, right? Um, we don't need to go into the techniques today, but this is just one of an arsenal of techniques that I use during my healing process. I, I came to the understanding of what I loved. What did I love so much? What did I love? What did I really, really, really love? I loved playing, you know, paddle tennis. I loved, you know, my family. I loved certain things in my life, right? And I, I, when I think about those things, it brought me so much happiness and joy and peace and lightness. Now, with this technique, you take all that love, right? And you move it into something that you'd like to get rid of in your life. Interesting. So you take all that love and you put it into your anxiety symptom. 
you put it into these intrusive thoughts. You put it into the feelings that are looking to protect you. And if you can just move that love from those things that are obvious to the things that you are challenged with, right? What's going to happen is the very thing that you've been fighting with for so long and engaged in this tug of war is going to start to dissipate and go away because there's no longer a reason for it to be there. And when I started to move from fear to acceptance and love, I started to, you know, there were parts of me that just didn't want to accept it. It didn't want to accept change, you know, because so much of anxiety, if not almost all of anxiety is perceived threat response, right? I had so much, I had knee problems. I had back problems. Comment below if you can relate to some of these physical pains. I had so many pains. I had so many symptoms. I had so much dizziness and depersonalization. And for so long, I was trying to get rid of all of these things. I hated them. Right? I didn't want to live with them anymore. And that fear, that anger, and that resentment, and that blame fed in, energetically fed in, to those things that I no longer wanted to live with. And therefore, they stuck around. Because now I was justifying the fear response. Chronic fatigue, for example. McCormick, LG. Dristip, nice to have you here, my friend. Um, <coughs> Lucy Lou, Dennis, my son went through something similar to you. Isn't that interesting? Um... Keep those questions in your mind in a few minutes. We're going to get into them. But I want you to understand that there are parts of you that are catching up to the changes that you're making. So there's no need to be frustrated by how you still feel or what you're still experiencing. Take the frustration out. And here's what I'd like to recommend. Instead of identifying yourself with the mind or identifying yourself with the body, Start identifying with your start identifying with being something greater than your mind and your body. This helped me a lot, and this may have a religious or spiritual connection to it. You know, put all that aside. We don't need to label what this is, but we can start to disconnect and disassociate ourselves from being anything that crosses our mind and anything that we sense or feel in our body, right? And therefore, we are beyond these things. And you start to go, oh, that's just something coming from my lower self. I like to call it my lower self, the subconscious mind body now. Uh, this is a term that I really respect and I really believe can help a lot of people. You can call it the small you, little me, doesn't matter. So you get these symptoms, you get these challenges, mental, emotional, physical challenges, and you start to label them as, oh, that's just my little me looking to protect. That's just my little me perceiving some kind of danger in the future. That little me, your lower self, doesn't want me to go outside potentially to socialize with someone. Maybe I'll make some kind of a mistake. Maybe I'll look like a fool. Maybe I'll be ridiculed. Maybe... I'll make some kind of mistake out there, right? Or I don't want to go into a social gathering or whatever it is. It could be a social thing. It could be a creative thing. Don't start that business that you want to start because you may fail at it, right? You may feel even worse than how you feel right now. So people become symptomatic. And this symptomaticness isn't so much about trying to ruin your mind or ruin your body. It's more so about looking to protect you from some kind of perceived threat. And when we start to look at this as a perceived threat, we start to go, oh, I understand why the dizziness is here, right? Comment below if you go through dizziness or depersonalization, just so I know. This tends to be one of the top uh, symptoms of people going through my programs and I've worked with in the past. Do you experience the dizziness, the brain fog, the depersonalization?
all the time, Karen says. Salma says, I do. Lucy says, I, yeah, Disney, I mean, let, well, here's, here's something that's very comforting, guys. Here's something that's very comforting for you. The dizziness is there to protect you from increased emotional intensity. So you may have had panic attacks or anxiety attacks in the past. And the dizziness is there so that it, you can function throughout the day without having to experience those high levels of emotions that you experienced once in your life. These could be traumas. These could be panics. These could be anxiety attacks. These could be ridiculed. You could have been embarrassed by somebody or a host of people. So the dizziness is there as a protective mechanism. Now, once we start to spread a certain degree of love and appreciation for the dizziness, the appreciation for the symptoms, the appreciation for the elements of anxiety, oh my God, it's incredible what can happen when you replace the fear with appreciation. I'm no longer afraid of what the dizziness is going to do to me because that's keeping me very tense. That's keeping me very rigid in thoughts and in body, right? By being afraid, you're only fueling the anxiety symptoms further. So this, the dizziness is there because the dizziness feels like it needs to be there because we haven't done a good enough job of mastering our lower selves, right? Consciously saying, Hey, lower self, there's no need for the dizziness here. There's no need for that because those experiences from the past are no longer going to be in the present moment. So the symptoms have been mastering us. The intrusive thoughts have been mastering us. The lower self has been mastering us. And we need to start mastering those things without looking to bully them. All right. Because if you bully them, they'll get defensive. That just gives us another reason for the symptoms and all the elements of anxiety. So comment below and let me know what the biggest epiphany for you was. Don't be frustrated. I'll say it again. Don't be frustrated by the, the, the progress or the lack of progress that you're currently making around anxiety because there are parts of you that are looking to catch up to the change work that you're doing, right? Catching up to the things that you're doing in the morning that you never did before, catching up to the way you're speaking to yourself now. For so long, I bet, I, I know you well. You've been very hard on yourself. Right? I know that. And whether you know it or not, that's the truth. You've been very hard on yourself. You haven't allowed yourself to, to make mistakes. You've only allowed yourself to be perfect, and there has been nothing else. Every experience needs to be very similar to the, the same experience as yesterday or else you start to beat yourself up. How could I have done that? Why did I do that? Why did people treat me this way? Yada, yada, yada. Right? So you have to start being gentle towards yourself and you have to start understanding that it's okay to experience anxiety. It's okay to experience what you're experiencing right now. And it starts there. It starts with the feeling of, hey, just because I have these sensations and symptoms doesn't mean I have to fight with them. I can accept them. I can surrender to them. I don't have to be them. I don't have to let them lead my life. Right? I don't have to provoke them. So these are important points. And you start identifying with something greater than your mind and body. A lot of the questions that we're going to get today are related to lower self um, directives, okay? So subconscious mind or lower self directives. Someone may be saying, oh, but I'm so very afraid of the brain thing that may happen to me because I've had this migraine for a long time. Well, that's not coming from the part of you that is clear. That's not coming from the part of you that is real or intuitive. That's not coming from you, the decision maker. That idea is coming from the lower self. And why is it there, right? I want you to answer that. Why is it there? Because we talked about it. Cheers, my friends. Happy holidays. Shani, happy holidays. Vernice, I saw you on here somewhere. Nice to see you. Always wonderful. D 
DPDR, of course. DPDR is a, it can be a traumatic experience on a daily basis. Yeah, if the world is not real, right? I understand. How long does DPDR last? That, that depends on a lot of factors. That depends on how quickly you consume this information and start actively sending safety signals to your mind-body, right? That depends on a, on a lot of factors. When someone asks a question based on the time it takes to end something or replace it with something, it takes the right kind of person to eliminate these elements of anxiety. Are you the right kind of person right now? Or... Are you simply going through the motions? Going through the motions is kind of like, oh, but I did that breathing thing yesterday in the morning, or I did this meditation this evening. Why do I still feel X? That's going through the motions. Okay. Oh, it's been a week or it's been two weeks that I've, you know, looked to engage in my inner change work, right? I no longer associate with being an anxiety identity. Why are things not changing? That's going through the motions, right? One love, happy holidays. Vernice, I'm glad you're here as well. Right? Um, Asho Khan, you're very welcome for the care and support. It's nice to have you here. Um, is shame necessarily a bad thing, Joanna? I don't think so. I don't think shame is a bad thing. I think that shame, I think it's okay to experience shame and all negative feelings and emotions. It's fine to experience them. However, I think we can now choose to not allow shame to branch off to other things like past stories, more past stories, future experiences, yada, yada, yada. I think there's a lot of healing that can come from allowing ourselves to feel shame, guilt, blame, these sorts of things, fear, right? And, and in some ways, letting go and surrendering to them, right? So, yeah, let's go into questions now. So did that help? I hope that some of that, um, some of that helped. Um, I can go deeper into going through the motions of anxiety recovery uh, compared to starting to live your life this way, you know, because for a long time I went through the motions of anxiety recovery, like, you know, I'm doing this and I'm doing that, right? Why aren't things getting better? That, that's not the right mindset. The right mindset, anxiety is trying to bring the best out of you, right? That's what anxiety is trying to do, is trying to bring the best out of you. It's trying to, to put you on a path that is different than the path that you've been on for quite some time. So this is a little bit, it's, it's difficult to grasp this at the beginning stages, but you'll get it. You'll get it. Um, thank you, Alicia. Very, very... Good. So um, let's go into these questions here. If I missed your questions, guys, please repeat them. I'll try to go through them um, uh, in as much detail as quick as I can. Uvej um, Zemali. hope I said that right. What do you mean with going through the motion and how should it be done? So going through the motions is kind of like saying, well, I'm doing X, Y, and Z. Why am I not getting the result? Okay, that's kind of like going through the motions. However, instead of going through the motions, you want to start living your life in the way that you need to, not only to heal anxiety, but to become someone different. Meaning, you go through your day at a much slower speed than you would if you were experiencing anxiety, right? You go, your breathing patterns are slower, your bodily movements are slower. You're projecting peace. You're projecting slowness. You're projecting safety. Project safety. This is a way of life. This isn't just something that you do to get rid of a symptom, if that makes sense. So this comes down to a mindset. You must live this way every single day. Another example is, for so long, for so many anxiety sufferers out there, life has been very loud, right? 
Uh, you need things to be loud. You need to keep speaking. You need to be around loud people, noise all the time to make you feel distracted from your symptoms. Comment below if this could be you. And now you're respecting silence more, right? You're kind of going through your day having mini vacations where you meditate or you take a nap or you slow things down or you are very mindful about how you're doing things. So it's more so about living this way rather than trying to get rid of an element of anxiety, right? So don't just go through the motions. Understand that this is a lifestyle. This is a lifestyle change, right? Um, Lucy Lou, how do you heal anxiety when you have a life-threatening disease? Um, are you talking about yourself, Lucy, or are you talking about someone else? Or is this some kind of projection that you have right now? Let me know because that will be easier to answer. Um, here's, how, here's how I believe would be the best way to go about healing your anxiety if there's some kind of a disease in place, okay? Please understand that so very much of any kind of disease or illness comes down to the mental and emotional suppression of negative ideas, okay? Negative feelings and negative ideas. If you think about it, it's kind of like a box, right? And the body is the box. And for so long, we have been putting these negative perceptions, negative ideas, um, fear, anger, sadness, guilt, blame, and that box, when that box starts to overflow, sometimes people can experience some kind of a physical response. And the way you can go about your healing now, because I want you to expect a miracle, Lucy. I want you to expect a miracle. Okay, I know you're going through some kind of disease or illness right now, but do not get caught up in the label. Understand that positive feelings and positive emotions have the potential to change things at a cellular cellular level. Change things in your joints, your organs, your muscles, everything. And it's not about hoping. It's not about wishing. It's not about praying, although prayer is very, very powerful. It's about expecting the miracle. So, Lucy, um, all you have to start doing right now, I truly believe this to be the case for so many people, is to start unloading what has been suppressed in that box, in the body for so very long. Technique-wise, Lucy, go into my reframing playlist and do the negative emotional, um, emotional reframing negative energy. Emotional reframing negative energy. Uh, do that reframe on a daily basis. Uh, you can even follow spontaneous remission work coming from people like Bruce Lipton, uh, Joe Dispenza, uh, Brent Baum, Stephen Parkhill. I mean, the list goes on and on. If it's related to some kind of cancer, there's a great book out there called Answer Cancer by Stephen Parkhill, Lucy. I highly recommend that you get that and you start to shift the way you see what it is you're going through, right? But trust me, um, you can do this. You can do this. Right? You can get over this. You really, really, really can. I know in this world, people, you go to the physicians and stuff, and nothing, nothing bad against physicians. They're trained to you know, express the way they do and do what they do and such. But we're programmed to believe that once we get a specific label or something, mental, emotional, physical, that it's going to be the end all, be all, right? But please understand that this can be a hiccup. It can be um, some kind of block on the road, right? So we can start to see it that way, okay? I love you. I love you so very much. And um, we're with you 100%. And um, things are going to get better. You just have to learn from what brought you to this place, right? Alicia, let's see. Um, Dennis, what do you think about using biofeedback as a therapeutic technique? I'm a fan of it. Yeah, I'm a fan of it. Uh, please do your research on that specifically. Um, 
Yeah. Sorry, I'm just a little bit um, caught up when someone is going through some kind of a very distressing experience. It kind of, it hits me. And I just want people to, uh, to see that uh, they can get through anything. So, <laughs> uh, excellent. Uh, Rakesh, let's see. How to prevent excess sweating during social conversation and stop the ear from becoming red? Well, the ear is going to keep being red, right? And the excess sweating is still going to be there until the body feels safe and the mind feels safe in that particular environment, Rakesh. So when you're outside of the environment, I would continue to do the surrender sessions on this YouTube channel each and every day. Uh, the surrender sessions, the letting go sessions, those are scientifically proven to get you out of the fight or flight response, bring balance back to the autonomic system so that you can begin to project safety into the world. Okay, so I would, number one, continue to do the surrender sessions on a daily basis. And secondly, I would really focus on in the very moment when you start to feel that coming on, I would slow down. I would slow everything down. I would focus on low and slow breathing, okay? Breathing through your diaphragm, nice and slow. And I would do any other intuitive um, responses that come to you that project safety. Remember, you're trying to project safety to your lower self. You're trying to project safety to the little me, the little me that senses some kind of danger here or in the future, right? So those are some of the things that I would do. XTB Snow, thank you, brother. I watched you first time. Welcome. I will see more of your videos. Grateful. I have health anxiety. You are experiencing health anxiety. You don't have it, right? Notice the difference between these two sentences. I have health anxiety. Say that to yourself. I have health anxiety compared to I'm having the experience of health anxiety, right? I'm having the experience of health anxiety. Notice the difference, right? But thank you so much for, um, for this, right? And so much of the answers that come from me to you guys today is about keeping up with the safety signals, right? The mental signals that you send to your body in those very moments where you experience the symptoms, the physical uh, safety signals that you send to your body, right? Um, the body wants to be heard. You don't want to ignore your symptoms. If you ignore your symptoms, they're going to get louder. Okay, so we need to acknowledge the symptoms. We need to acknowledge the intrusive ideas. And honestly, like I mention often in my programs, when you build a better relationship with these very things that you've been looking to get rid of for so long, when the relationship changes, you're going to feel like even if the symptoms are there, they're, they're not bothersome anymore, right? And that's true healing when you're no longer falling for the interpretation around the symptom because the symptom and the interpretation are both coming from the same place, right? The symptom is there out of a need to protect. The interpretation that says, oh my God, this could be some kind of a, a physical problem is also there to keep you in your comfort zones, Right? So they're working together. They're all coming from the same place. The mental, the, the, the emotional, the physical, right? the, the mental imagery. It's all coming from the lower self. It's all coming from the little you. This is so powerful, guys. It's, so, it's, it's like the spine of your healing. It's, it's it. It's it. We're tapping into it now. Here we are. We're here. It says surrender right there. That's it, Bernice. Um, the, the big problem these days is that when people go through some kind of mental health issue or emotional turmoil or physical being symptomatic, you know, because 
of such a prolonged time being in that threat response, people see it as something that they need to get rid of and something that they're not allowed to have or something that makes them feel like they're crazy or something's wrong with them. In today's modern world, like I mentioned, it's so loud that it's hard not to have anxiety in some element, in some way, to some degree. And so it's so, so important not to label yourself that way. It's so, so important to realize that this is a chapter, a chapter that's bringing you back to the way you should be living your life and not being so caught up in things internal or external, right? Shani, visualization of my emotions during anxiety is really helpful to me. Absolutely. Um, you'll notice that's why I have so many mental imagery related techniques on this channel and through my programs. Um, I'm a very big fan of getting people into a into a brainwave state where they can become suggestible to different ideas, right? So mental imagery while you're in a calm state, I don't believe there's anything as powerful as that. Um, of course, the mindful stuff is important too throughout the day, but you know, you can really supercharge your healing if you're doing a lot of visualization work as well in the right way. Um, Strawberry polka dot. I feel like I'm going through a setback, but working my way back through it. I love it. Good for you. Good for you. Well done. We're behind you 100%. I love the attitude. You know, during a setback, guys, it's so easy to go into victimhood. It really is. Like, it's so easy to blame the world. It's so easy to blame God. It's so easy to blame. But if you can just take that setback and go... I really did push myself too hard or I really took on too much. People with a dysregulated nervous system um, take on too much when they feel like they're making a lot of progress, right? They feel like, oh, I'm back to my normal self and now I can do all the things that brought me anxiety in the first place. No, <laughs> not necessarily. I fell for this trap. <laughs> Don't fall for that trap. It's a new life, right? Like we said, don't just go through the motions of anxiety healing, right? Live this way. Live slowly. Live peacefully. Make grounding practices a priority, right? Make yourself a priority. Slow things down. Take naps throughout the day. Give back in a loving way to your lower self. All these things, right? Stop fighting. Stop competing. Stop listening to people's interpretation of what recovery, anxiety, healing, or whatever it is, is if they've never gone through it themselves. Um, there's no need to fear anything, even death. I'll say it, even death. We've been misled when it comes to death, right? And I've had intuitive experiences that, you know, that speak to this, that acknowledge this idea. So all fear is distraction. Trust me. Trust me on this. All fear is distraction. None of it is true. None of it. But this world would rather have you live in fear than live in love. Right? Um, and I know I'm, I'm talking a little bit on the, further along on the path. Right? I hope it speaks to you guys. But sometimes intuitively I just feel like I need to just kind of say these things that come up. Um, let's see here. How do you, Jessica, Jessica Gee, welcome. How do you manage mental symptoms of an attack, attack, anxiety attack, introductive thought while having an attack? Yeah. Um, so while you're having an attack, right, so, Jessica, let's backtrack a little bit and let's pick up some of the crumbs that tend to lead to the attack, okay? Because there's a lot of people that want to know what to do during an attack, but they're not really focused on the, the things that are happening prior to that attack. 
You know, when you wake up in the morning, it's imperative that you start your day right away from the identity of already being healed. Okay, so let me ask you that question of if you never experienced another anxiety attack, what kind of uh, morning would that person have? What kind of afternoon, what kind of evening would that person have? How would that person go about their day? What sort of thoughts would they have about things? How would they perceive things? One of the most powerful things you can do to prevent these anxiety attacks is just to put your put yourself in the shoes, the mind body of peace. Okay, so your healed self would see the world in a peaceful manner, right? And would therefore go about the day in a very peaceful manner. So when you wake up, Jessica, in the morning, put that word peace because that's what spoke to you. Peace on your wall, across you when you wake up, just to remind you of who you really are, okay? Because anxiety as an emotion is more so a mentally made up emotion, okay? It's a mentally made up emotion. Um, It's a mentally created emotion. And it's not true. It's not real, although it feels very real and something that we have to overcome. But um, that's the first thing, okay, is to put yourself into the shoes of the person that has already healed anxiety attacks from morning throughout the day. How would this person uh, function throughout the day? That's the first thing. Secondly, as you're having the attack, it's important, it's imperative that you don't look to overly control anything because it'll only feed into the fear or the perceived fear. So it's not about, oh my God, I really have to control my breathing now because it's very difficult when you're experiencing such a, a high level of emotional intensity, anxiety attack to want to control the breathing. Your breathing is fine, okay? Even the thoughts, these sorts of things. So if you can practice the skill of surrendering in that very moment to what's taking place in mind and body, that is the end goal. And to pull your attention to what's on the left and what's on the right of you, okay? What can you see on the left? Oh, that's over there. I never realized. What's, what can you see on the right? Oh, I can see that over there. It's a new color. I never realized that. What can I hear on the left? What can I hear on the right? What can I feel? What can I touch on the left? What can I touch on the right? So when you have an attack, the anxiety attack is trying to pull you into tunnel vision, getting you to focus on the, the threat that's taking place, right? And so it can, I mean, attacks are the closest thing that I've ever experienced to death. And it's incredibly bothersome. However, it's very important that you focus on, you know, pulling your attention outside of your tunnel vision and becoming aware of things around you, which is going to help do the surrender, okay? Focus on looking to surrender to that very moment. It's a practice. You're not going to get very good at it at first. And go about your day, go about your day in the shoes of someone who's already healed this, okay? So these are important notes to jot down. I hope it helps. Cheers, guys. Happy holidays. Uh, Deep C, how do you overcome constant high anxiety when you have lots of responsibility, kids, etc.? That's a great question. It's a great question. Deep C, I want you to focus from here on out, to focus not on the fact that anxiety healing is difficult because your responsibilities, but I want you to focus on the idea that whether you have these responsibilities or not, anxiety may still be there, number one. It is not the responsibilities that are provoking anxiety. It's the perceived threats around the responsibilities that are provoking the anxiety. And what I mean by that is your body is becoming more symptomatic. You're mentally possibly becoming more mentally symptomatic, emotionally symptomatic, because you want to make sure that things are orderly with the kids, okay? And so 
it's not so much that the anxiety is bothersome, it's the need to keep control and certainty around the kids or any other responsibility. So what I would practice as you're going through your, your responsibilities and your priorities throughout the day is intuitive safety signals. If I could send my lower self or the little me a safety signal right now that being around these kids or having these responsibilities is safe, what would I think? How would I think? How would I act? How would I use my body? And start taking notes, right? Write down all the kinds of safety signals that you get intuitively. I don't want to go into them um, in this particular uh, live. I will in a future video. But think about it like it's all about projecting safety in the environment, present or future, and it's not about the responsibilities. The symptoms are there to get you out of the environment, okay, so that you're not overwhelmed or experience some kind of trauma that you have in the past, okay? And so even the derealization, yeah, derealization, and the dizziness and the depersonalization, like I mentioned earlier, is all there to keep you functional throughout the day. It's like a, it's a chemical protective response to keep you functional throughout the day and not have you experience panic attacks throughout, you know, the experiences that you're going to have in the day, right? So, um, yeah, so it really depends on where your focus goes and what kind of safety signals you're sending through mind and body as you're in those environments, right? Focus on this and don't focus so much on the fact that the responsibilities are provoking anxiety. It's the perceived threat that's per provoking anxiety. And you can be in those environments and still feel safe. And as long as you feel safe, the symptoms will slowly subside, right? Um, one other thing, Deep Sea, is you could go into my reframing playlist here on this YouTube channel and look up future reframe. Okay, if you're if you're you get up in the morning and you have 15 minutes, you go through that visualization process, and you can visualize the experience before it physically happens, right? And you're experiencing it in a very safe manner and there is no anxiety, and you go through that experience, those are very powerful techniques, right? Uh, I'm a big fan of mindset and techniques. I believe that mindset is more important, but for some people, they need the techniques. So go into the reframing playlist, future reframe. If there's any anxiety-provoking experience that might show up in the future, future reframe it, right? Thank you guys so much for your interactions, by the way. Um, you know, you don't need to comment. You don't need to like this video. You don't need to do any of that. You don't need to listen to me. You don't need to, but you are here. There's a part of you that believes that, you know, you need to hear something here and you need to actively implement it into your life. And I just want to say I'm really grateful. Um, <clears throat> You're very welcome. You're very welcome. Let's see here. I'll just keep scrolling and see what I missed. Um, if I may as well, as I go through the comments, guys. Um, fear will look for more things to worry about, okay? Fear will look for more things to worry about. There is never an end to what you can worry over, okay? Um, 
once the worries externally start to go away, they tend to go back inside. Now we're concerned about health concerns and such. Um, so it's really important that you understand that um, it's really this game that we continue to be a part of. And when you get to a point where you realize and you say, I'm no longer going to play this game that the lower self wants me to play, where I am constantly worried over something new, um, when you start playing that game, it's a very vulnerable experience. And, uh, and you start to feel a little bit naked. You start to go, well, I'm not worried about much anymore. I need to keep worrying because it's been a part of my identity for so long. One of the biggest problems that so many of us in the world have is that we've placed so much value on worry, right? The more I worry, the better parent I'll be. I'll feel significant. I'll feel appreciated in some way. And so we need to start devaluing the worry, okay? Worry isn't giving you the answers that you seek. Worry is sucking the life experience out of your life. And so the next time a worry shows up, you have to go, well, am I really worried about this thing? Or is it just part of the game that my lower self continues to play with me? Is the little me screaming so loud, not because something is true, but because it's looking to keep me safe from making another mistake or it's perceiving some kind of threat? These are the questions that you have to start asking yourself, right? Is this real or is this just part of the game? Let's see here. Sage Bun, grateful for all that you do. Oh, you're very welcome. I don't know what I would be now if I didn't find your videos. That's very nice. Very nice, kind words, and I'm glad I could help, really. Um, let's see. Um, Pamela, how do I not hyperventilate in public when I panic? Well, there's a couple things. One is the hyperventilation is there because, again, because of a perceived threat, right? There's some kind of danger in the environment, present, future. So um, the idea is not to focus on not hyperventilating, right? The idea is to send safety signals through your breath as you're going into that environment or as you're going about the day. So when you go into public, uh, public places, right? There is this hesitation. There's this anticipation that you might hyperventilate because it's been such a emotionally intense experience in the past, right? So naturally, naturally, you're going, well, I might hyperventilate again. I don't like that feeling. So remember, it's all coming from the lower self, Right? The lower self is trying to get you out of that same public experience. So it's projecting a symptom. If you don't hyperventilate, the lower self will probably give you a migraine. Right? It'll give you a migraine. And if it doesn't give you a migraine, it'll give you muscle twitching. If it doesn't give you muscle twitching, it'll give you pelvic pain. Or it may give you knee pain or lower back pain. Right? Um, this sort of TMS response, this sort of mind-body projection is ongoing all the time. Therefore, Pamela, it's not about the hyperventilation. It's about asking yourself the question of how do I need to think about this experience and what do I need to do in order for my lower self to feel safe in public, right? And I will, I always, I, this is one of my the go-tos to begin calming the nervous system or dysregulate a nervous system is go and start doing the surrender sessions, okay? Get the surrender sessions under your belt. Do two, three a day if you can. YouTube, surrender sessions, the anxiety guy, okay? Um, do those. There's one for identity. There's one quick one for health anxiety, and there's a main one for generalized anxiety, those surrender sessions are going to get you out of this place because when you are incredibly hypervigilant and constantly fixated on fear, how can you possibly see the safety? You can't. 
So we have to get the system more balanced first and foremost in order to open up to the answers. You can't have the answers up here, okay? Because lower self is saying, no, don't even engage in life. Just stay in your bedroom where you're safe, right? Um, I, I term it the lower self. You can call it subconscious mind body. You can call it little me. You're know, going about your day. Oh, there's my little me again, trying to project a symptom, right? Man, I'm bored of it, right? Dizziness again, yeah, whatever. So you can project, you can, you can call it goofy. You can call it Mickey Mouse. I don't care what you call it, right? And neither does it. All it wants to know is whether uh, whether you should be keeping the same interpretation of life or change it, right? That's all the lower self wants to know. But because we haven't trained it, we think that these things happen automatically. They don't. They don't. We have to master the lower self rather than allowing the lower self to master us. The lower self is the projection of anxiety all the time. Perceived threat, overwhelm, right? Overthinking, worry, symptoms, symptoms, intrusive thoughts, negative emotions. All of this is under the same umbrella. Uh, let's see here. Warren Kipp, surrender sessions for health anxiety. Yes, I just discovered your channel. Must go find these videos. Yes, please find them. Um, they are they are a staple. Okay, there's a couple things I would say is if you really want to get organized with this healing journey, start one of my programs at theanxietyguide.com. Do the surrender sessions on a regular basis. Okay, they're there for the the health anxiety one is quick. It's about six minutes, and you can do it multiple times throughout the day. I highly recommend that you do. Um, and I, I did it quick, deliberately, because health anxiety sufferers have a very difficult time focus on, on, focusing on anything but their symptoms. So for a six-minute period, if they can focus, in, focus on surrendering to the very things that they are challenged by, such as the symptoms and intrusive ideas, then that's going to that's gonna bring us down from that, you know, that... Uh, highly aroused, you know, place, very sensitized. Um, Because let me tell you something, you you guys, I'll tell you this, you're not who you're not who you are, right? You're not who you think you are right now, right? You're not who you think you are right now. Um, Anxiety is coloring who you think you are, and how you see things. It's really painting a very fearful picture about life. And you're going to get to a point where you look back and you start to go, well, Jesus. Wow. And you may still be experiencing the symptoms and all that stuff, but you're going, goodness me, you know. I used to see life in such a different way. I used to see myself in such a different way. So... Remember, it's all being colored by anxiety right now. And none of it's true. It's all just a game. A game of protection. Okay? So, see it as so. Practice seeing it as so. Okay? Um, Mohammed, hi Dennis. You are inspiring us as always. You are very welcome. Let's see here. Inner Circle Program... Reframing, you're on the reframing week. I see more resistance, but I try to keep surrendering. Resistance is a good sign. Resistance is a good sign. Resistance is a very good sign. It's a sign that you're moving in the right direction. There will be resistance in mind. There will be resistance in emotions. And think about it like this. Tighten your fist. Tighten your fist. Really tight, 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 really, really tight, right? And now let go, right? And as you let go, notice some of the fragments that are left over as you start to let go. 
you'll notice that there's a lot of tiredness. Okay, when I'm tight, I'm looking to control, right? I'm looking to fight through things. When we loosen it up, right, now the hand is tired because it's been fighting for so long. It's been striving. It's been looking to be perfect for so long, right? And now as the hand lets go, there are certain fragments of past anxiousness and sensitivity that are still there, and that's called the resistance, right? Lindsay, how are you? Good to see you. Happy holidays. Uh, Lindsay doing some amazing things as well. Uh, amazing anxiety, right? Uh, here, there, and on Instagram. So I highly recommend following her as well. Um, great work. So resistance is a good sign. Resistance is a good sign. Uh, one of the things that you will come across, I hope you come across sooner rather than later, is where you go, the resistance is also from the same umbrella. That's why we talked about not just going through the motions of recovery, right? Going through the motions of recovery. Oh, I did this and I did that and I'm doing this and I'm doing that. Why isn't the result there? That's going through the motions, right? So instead of going through the motions, it's about, oh, the resistance is also a part of the lower self, right? The resistance is also a part trying to pull me back into that same space of anxiousness, right? The resistance is part of it. The symptoms are part of it. The intrusive ideas are part of it. The negative feelings and emotions are part of it. All of it is under the same colored umbrella of that lower self. Or I call it the lower self or the little me or subconscious, whatever you want to call it. Um, so then, you know, what's left? Yeah. I mean, you can, you have two, you have two paths that you can take, right? One is you can be drawn back into that overly protective lower self life that you used to live. You can be drawn back there. One experience can pull you right back into that anxiousness, right? Or... If your mindset is right, you'll continue on the path because either way you're going to struggle. Either way, there's going to be challenges. You can either be challenged through going backwards to the most familiar way of living your life with anxiety and that identity, or you can continue on the path that you're on with faith and trust that you're not necessarily trying to get somewhere. None of us are trying to get somewhere. We're trying to reveal what's been within us this whole time. And that's the more than anxiety moment right now. Let me give you an example of this, okay? For people that probably don't get it. Because with anxiety, we're looking to get rid of something. We're trying to get to that finish line, right? And when I used to do these surrender sessions, and I didn't have guidance, well... I had one of my favorites and still one of my favorites and bless her heart for coming up with um, audios around brain sync, uh, Kelly Howell, who's fantastic, fantastic, but not for everybody, right? But her meditations really helped me. Um, I got to a point where I was doing those meditations, guided or just, you know, theta healing type stuff. Um, and I started to get into a state where I went so deep and I went deep right here in my heart, so deep that I realized that inner peace was within me this whole time. And it really felt like, you know, I'm going to go a little bit deep right now, but hope you don't mind. It felt like I was more so connected to uh, this universal uh, energy, this universal way, um, rather than the anxiety, meaning the body and all its symptoms, the mind and all its intrusive ideas. And I remember doing these meditations and going, I don't even care. Like, I don't even care that any of that old stuff is there, all the fear. And I, I just remember feeling so much love and acceptance for those things that were looking to protect me, those, those threat response or those perceptions of danger, which is basically what the majority of what it was. 
So I want, I'm saying, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you this, guys, because I want you to understand that what you're feeling isn't necessarily who you are. Uh, what you're thinking isn't necessarily who you are, or it's not really thinking. It's more so replaying the same ideas, right? Um, emotionally, what you're feeling emotionally isn't really who you are, um, But there's something deeper there. And the surrender sessions on this YouTube channel will get you there. Um, So anyway, there's my rant (laughs) about that. (laughs) I told you, if you ask a question, there's no telling where we'll go. Right? Okay, so uh, yeah. Oh, wow. Thank you so much, Jack, for the... uh, for the uh, donation. That's very, very nice of you. Um, I might as well answer your question with the donation, right? I suffer from irrational thinking, repugnant obsessions, which cause me severe anxiety. Where is a good place to start? Surrender sessions. Surrender sessions. Uh, look up the anxiety guy, surrender sessions. Uh, I would I really start with some of the, uh, because there's two things that you need. You need the mindset and you need some techniques, right? You, need, you don't need a lot, right? I mean, look at Bruce Lee, right? And Bruce Lee, he, he didn't have a dozens and dozens of incredible moves and skills. He just mastered, you know, a handful of things that made him the best in what he was. So that's kind of the approach I want you guys to have is, whether you're going about the day and having some kind of mindful technique to project safety onto the experience, that's great. That could be related to deep breathing. That could be related to the speed in which you go about your day. Um, facial expressions could, you know, facial expressions could be anything, right? Projecting joy, projecting peace, projecting love. Um, so yeah, you can have these techniques and the mindset. So, um, honestly, Jack, I would start with the surrender sessions, and this is very much an intuitive journey, uh, and I would see where that takes you next, right? It's very hard for me to tell people where to start because I'm not really sure where they are, right? And people that give you this black and white kind of approach to healing um, is very, it's very, it's coming from a very good place. However, I personally have a difficult time telling everybody that this is this is the only way, right? Um, some people may need to... Either way, it's about safety projections. We know that, right? It's about projecting safety to the lower self, past, present, future. And that's a big, big part of it. A huge part of it. But anyway... Homeostasis, absolutely, Lindsay. Tell them. Boom. Words of wisdom. I love it. Fantastic, fantastic. Um, Really helpful stuff. Love your channel, love what you do. It's so nice to connect. Um... Let's see here. Uh, how can I work on self-forgiveness? I have a meditation, trash and a half. I have a meditation specifically for forgiveness on this channel. So just put in the keyword forgiveness, the anxiety guide meditation or something like that. What's in my drink? Um, cayenne pepper and lemon. Mmm, not for everyone. Stingy. I like it. I, I'm like the human guinea pig. I'll try everything. All right. uh, let's see here. Happy holidays, everybody. Absolutely. For everybody that celebrates. Uh, Bogus Binted. I love these names. Hello, Dennis. I have a question. Are you a therapist? Uh, If not, how did you learn about how anxiety works? 
I am not a certified therapist. And some people may take that as being um, kind of offensive, saying, you know, why are you teaching this stuff when you're not even certified or you're not a psychologist or a psychotherapist or this and that? A long time ago, I decided that, and I was intuitively pulled into a more holistic direction. And I feel a lot freer in this way of teaching. Uh, Life kind of brought me uh, full circle into this anxiety coaching kind of realm that, you know, that I am intrigued by. So uh, I don't know what the rest of the question was. Let me just see here. Now, how did I learn about anxiety? Well, I experienced it since I was about six, seven, maybe even earlier. Um, when I'm thinking about the the real roots of the beginning of anxiety disorders and such for myself, uh, which is the case for many people, whether they know it or not. But um, And how did I learn? Uh, I had some really good teachers, really, really good teachers. Um, like amazing teachers. Uh, I am very lucky to have worked with some of these teachers personally um, in the hypnotherapy realm, in the mind-body realm, you know, in the uh, all sorts of things. Um, I can mention those teachers if you'd like. I don't think they mind. Um, some are still here, some are not, but, and here we are. Uh, yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> How did I learn? I don't know. Here I am. I, trust me, 10, 10, 15 years ago, I would not think that I'd be doing what I'm doing today. Okay. Full circle. But life has a funny way of kind of directing you in the direction you need to go in order to learn what you need to learn and help the way you need to help. Uh, Let's see here. Oh, Lucy Lou, what you went through was your best teacher also. Who was my best teacher, I'm guessing you're asking? Please ask again. Uh, Is it okay to drink coffee if you struggle with anxiety, DPDR? I would not, no. I would not drink coffee if you struggle with... um, being so hyper aroused and hyper fixated um, and symptomatic, I would not drink coffee, period. Um, there's a lot of things. When it comes to DPDR, when it comes to these symptoms, when it comes to anxiety disorders, I'm a big believer that there's a lot of things you need to take out instead of looking to put in. It's like a, a, a full cup, right? There's just so many patterns and habits and things that we've done that we've become accustomed to. Drinking coffee, staying up late, uh, action-packed movies, um, stimulating relationships. All of these things have created this overflowing cup, right? And it's important for us to first take those things out so that we have space to put things back in. And so um, I would focus on... Anything that can potentially create a perception of danger, okay, put it away. Done. Not just done, right? You know, uh, go hug a tree, right? Even your lower self will think that that's safe. Go hug a tree. Go walk in nature, right? Really slowly, okay? Don't rush. Um, Exercise is different, but dysregulated nervous system, watch how much you take on. Um, Can SSRIs cause DPDR? In the past and through my own research, yes, they have the potential to do so. Um, Let's see here. Karen, I feel you learn more from people who have been there. You know, therapists learn a lot. Uh, yeah, I, I personally couldn't really connect with um, with the therapist realm, although there are so many great therapists out there. Um, it is what it is. It is what it is. Um, let's see. 
So, yeah, please uh, watch out with the coffee and all that other stuff I mentioned. We'll take another question or two, guys. And then we shall move on. Oh, let's see. Questions. I have not heard of that person, Bogus Binted. I'll just sit here clapping my hands till a question shows up. Ah. Tot patot. Tot tot patot. Do you still feel anxiety? No. Bogus Binted. How long did it take you to recover? Uh, let's define what recovery is first. Okay, so in my eyes, recovery is getting yourself autonomically to a place of being more balanced and uh, no longer fearing the things that you used to fear, no longer allowing that part of you to lead. Um, It took me about three to six months to get my nervous system to a place where it was not working so hard in a threatening manner. I felt a lot of peace and I felt a lot of um, clarity, mental clarity. Uh, The brain fog lifted, the depersonalization lifted. All the symptoms lifted. And uh, I was able to do exercise in the way that I would like to. And I could, in fact, this is the biggest thing. I could go into experiences without being overwhelmed. Um, Physically overwhelmed, mentally and emotionally overwhelmed. So it took me about three to six months. Yeah. But I was religious with this stuff, guys. When I set my mind to something... It's going to happen, you know. Um, And I lay it out in the programs. If you guys are confused and want to take the confusion out of the healing journey, go to theanxietyguy.com, start a program. Um, Let's see here. Load of bull trading. I've become more and more afraid to sleep anywhere other than my own bed. Change my nightly routine. I'm afraid it's going to become debilitating. How can I get down to the bottom of this? Well, there's a couple couple things here, right? There's a couple directions we can go. Um, number one is you have to create a, a, a better relationship with that room and the bed itself. Um, one of the biggest things that helped me was uh, feeling cool, right? Not so hot. So uh, anxiety can bring in a lot of heat in the body and that heat can create a lot of tension and stagnancy uh, in the body. So um, there's that. So you want to create a better relationship with the room. I would change the colors. I would change the beddings. I would take the posters down. I would burn them. Don't burn them. Um, I would take the desk out of there. I would, you know, I would rearrange everything in a way where um, it feels like a haven of sorts. It feels like a temple where you can really rest. Put colors there that are related to your safety colors because colors, we have associations with colors. If there's a lot of you know, uh, trauma-related rela- colors or colors in that room and things that remind you of difficulty and challenges, then that's what's going to be there. So I-, I would put new objects there, change the coloring, and sit. I would sit in that room. I wouldn't try to sleep right away. I would start to feel good in that room, feeling good with the things that uh, you have put in that room. I would um, sleep naked. That can cool the system down. Uh, I wouldn't, before you sleep, I would definitely um, use some kind of a face mask so that it's completely dark. These are all, you know, things, these are like tips, right? 
But more than anything, I've realized that uh, sleep debt is not fun, uh, and you really need to take care of that sleep debt. There are many ways to do it. Um, two to three hours prior to sleep, just make sure that you're doing things that are boring, okay? Or at least what your lower self would deem as being boring, like reading a book, right? Because that's not what your lower self wants. It wants to be engaged in a movie, and it wants to do this, and it wants to do that, right? Do boring things. No white light, no computers, no phones, nothing like that. Um, eye mask, um, and change the room. Those are some of the things that I would do. Um, because a lot of this is happening at an unconscious level, if not all of it. All right. Let's see here. Wow, we've been going for a while. Uh, da, 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 da. Let's see here. I'll just scroll a bit. Did I have ear pressure symptom when I had anxiety? Not necessarily. I didn't have that one. But at one point, I had over 50 symptoms at the same time. And that was not cool. Cheyenne, happy holidays, my friend. Good to see you. Good to see you. Um, I love you all. Happy holidays to all of you. Thank you for joining me on this live. It's been really fun for me and engaging. I really love doing these. It brings me so much peace and enjoy to be able to, uh, to give back to you. I hope I've been able to be of service to you in some way. I hope what I've said kind of spoke to you in some way. If you know anybody who's suffering out there, please share this live with them. Maybe we can help a few more people. And um, keep up with the progress, my friends. I believe in you, and I hope that you're starting to believe in yourself, in this anxiety recovery journey, uh, coming back to you know our true selves, um, and living life in a peaceful manner. And um, honestly... Uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> I'll see you guys next time. Peace, much love, and enjoy the holidays, my friends. Bye-bye.